Oh, hi, everybody, and welcome to the October 2022 episode of Circle of Fellows. I am Shell Holtz. I am an IABC fellow and moderator for this episode. And uh, as at the moment, it looks like we have more of a triangle of fellows. Uh, we have uh, two participants who are having some te technical difficulties, different technical difficulties for each of them, but uh, difficulties nonetheless. But uh, there, there's enough knowledge and, and experience here uh, with the three of us to do just fine. And I expect that uh, Letty and Amanda will be able to join us at some point during the proceedings. Uh, but in the meantime, just want to let those of you watching live know that you are able to ask questions and share your observations and even your experiences in real time. Just use that chat feature in YouTube Live uh, and you'll be able to uh, share that information. We'll be able to post it on the screen and the panelists will be able to weigh in on what you've said. Uh, and with that, uh, let's uh, get some introductions out of the way. What I'd like you to do, um, if, if you will, uh, is when you introduce yourself, let us know uh, how you got started in consulting. What were you doing before? Uh, what led you to get started? And what is the scope of your work? Uh, who, who do you consult for? What nature of consulting are you, you engaged in? And Jane, um, let's start with you. Yeah. That's very traditional. Ladies first. Thank you, Michelle. Um, <laughs> great to be here. Hi, everybody. I Early on in my career, I worked for the BBC here in the UK, which is the British Broadcasting Corporation, TV, as you know, it, public broadcasting. It was my teenage ambition to work there. And when I arrived, that was it. Job done. Job for life, I decided. After a series of event, shall we say, um, I came to realize after about five or six, five or six years, which was a, a very um, double-sided coin for me. On the one side, I was on the one hand, I was working on incredibly dynamic, well-known TV programs, which when I mentioned them here in the UK, everybody says, oh, they were iconic. And it's true, they were. However, on the other side, was an organization that said one thing and did another, uh, which manifested itself for me as a young person early in their career with total confusion about my position in the organization and, and what it meant to be a part of it. And when I left, um, it was for reasons I realized only 20 years later, which was around values. Mm -hmm. And as I say, having stated one thing, they were behaving in a completely different way. And I made a decision then that I would never work for a corporate organization, but I would make it my life's work to help them encourage people to be the best that they could be and in, encourage leaders to be the best that they could be. And that led me fast forward about, well, as I say, 20, 20 plus years to working and understanding what I could offer as a consultant which was to help organizations understand what their how their rhetoric was manifesting itself in reality and how we could close the gaps. That's essentially it. And it tends to revolve around ethics and values and leadership behaviors. So I think that that, that for me was a really, that's where the penny dropped for me when I was handed a code of ethics. And I thought, oh, this is what I left the BBC. And it really helped me to, understand what I could do and what I could offer. Excellent. Thanks, Jane. George, how about you? Uh, what were you doing before and what led you to leave and what kind of consulting do you do? Well, uh, my background is I started out in, uh, in employee communications with uh, a large retail organization in the U.S. And after about five years of doing that, I moved over into the PR public relations agency field. And work with a a one of the larger larger firms at that time, Hill, Hill and Knowlton, which is a global PR firm. So, and over the succeed, the, the following uh, decade, I worked at Hill and Knowlton, and then at another uh, communications consulting firm that were all established businesses, as opposed to my own business. So, I think the point where I actually became a consultant myself was after those experiences, in um, two thousand two. 
I hung out my shingle and opened my own business. And what motivated me to do that was that I basically made all the mistakes I was going to make working on somebody else's payroll. So I learned what to avoid in running a consulting business and then felt comfortable starting my own. Of course, what I didn't realize then is that there was a whole bunch of other mistakes I wasn't aware of that I was going to make in the succeeding few years. And I've learned from that. And like the old saying goes, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Uh, the, what Jane talked about really resonated with me because I think if anybody looking to make a leap to becoming a consultant, you have to start with why you really want to do this and why you want to take this plunge. Um, and having a purpose in mind and a goal in mind is, I think, really key to your success. Thanks, George. And Letty, I'm glad you were able to connect with us. It looks like you're using a phone. Yes. <laughs> It works great, doesn't it? Um, so, Letty, uh, what were you doing before you became a consultant? What led you to make the change, and what's the focus of your consulting practice today? Uh, well, hello, everybody. Um, as you know, I'm based in Mexico City, uh, and I have been working for the last 30 years in different companies at, at American Express and other pharmaceutical companies like Merck and Sanofi always in communi strategic communication and external affairs. And uh, 10 years ago, I decided after I left Sanofi, I decided to be on my own because um, one of the reasons was that I always worked di with different PR agencies. I hired different communication and PR agencies. And I always thought that something could be done better. Um, I worked for different like uh, local agencies and, ex and international agencies. And I always thought that we could, uh, that a difference could be made the, to be more proactive, to really um, contribute with their with experience. Uh, many of the executives that worked for me um, were juniors and they didn't have the experience to really contribute as a, as a con consultant and communication. So after I left the last company, I decided to be on my own. And for the last 10 years, I have been working, uh, giving consultancy on employee communications, corporate reputation and external affairs. And I do some training also. Great, thank you. And uh, in Amanda's absence, I'll, I'll share my consulting story. I, I'm the member of the panel who is not currently a consultant. I am Senior Director of Communications at WebCore, which is a commercial builder uh, in California, headquartered in San Francisco. But I was an independent consultant for 21 years. Uh, and I was gainfully employed at the time I decided to become a consultant. I was with uh, Alexander and Alexander Consulting Group uh, as a regional communications practice leader. Uh, but I was increasingly getting calls from people who had heard me speak or read something I'd written about digital communication, uh, the web, email, all these, these newer forms of communication and asking if I could help with that. And my answer was always, no, that's not the kind of work we do here. Uh, and it, it occurred to me one day that I was leaving a lot of really interesting work on the table uh, in order to continue doing benefits and compensation communication, which I just had a hard time getting up for in the morning. Uh, so uh, at the age of 40, I just decided to take a shot at it and uh, started with uh, just a couple of clients uh, built the first media website for Bank of America and Cigna uh, and um, went from there. Uh, and the only reason I went back to the client side was that my work involved a ton of travel. Uh, and my biggest client, when I hung it up five years ago, was in the Philippines. I was flying to Manila every four to six weeks and it just got really old uh, and I didn't want to do it anymore. So mm -hmm. I, I started looking around for something that didn't require the travel and this job came up. Um, so I've, I've started on the client side then 21 years in consulting and then uh, back to the client side. Uh, and there are a lot of people who have taken journeys like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, let, let me ask, and Letty, I'll start with you. Um, what did you need in place already in order to start consulting? Um, what, what, what did you did you have to have clients? Did you have to have enough money? Uh, did you have to have market? What were your requirements in order to to launch your consulting practice? Well, first, I thought that I needed to have like the 
essential knowledge, uh, te technical knowledge, and, and I had all this knowledge and experience of 30 years, as I mentioned. And uh, so first I had to, uh, to be sure of how to focus and where to focus my consulting. So I decided first to, uh, to make a business plan and to uh, define where to focus my consulting and employee communications and corporate reputation. That was the main focus that I had. So I also, uh, I was sure that I needed uh, money. I needed some money to have, uh, uh, have an office, rent an office at that time, 10 years ago. And uh, a, a couple of people who could support me uh, in order to, uh, to develop all the strategies and, and the tactics. And, and of course, first uh, to have a list of prospects uh, of prospects of how to promote myself, how to market myself. Uh, because when I work in, in some of the companies, a lot of people told me, when you are on your own, uh, for sure I will be hiring you. Uh, but uh, you never know mm -hmm. if that will be uh, in the future. So uh, you, I have this list of people who, with whom I had worked before. And those were the ones that I contacted first because they knew how, how I worked and the results that I had. So I had to have a list of, a list of prospects and a, a business plan. I think that's quite important. Uh, you need to have like basic consulting skills, like uh, the capacity to get things done, the leadership, some management fundamentals of business, um, problem solving approaches. And, and I, I used to talk with other consultants before in order to get their input and what their experience was and what uh, and I asked them what uh, what they needed in order to be on their own. So that helped me a lot in order to start uh, on my own and to develop a, a list of all the things that I really needed before I went to look for clients. Uh, George, how about you? What, what did you find that you needed? Well, I think all the things that Letty covered or are, are sort of common denominators in people starting as a consultant. I think you want to have a comfort level that you've got a base of business you can start with or, or gather in from the start that's going to cover cover you as you build the business from there. But I think you also need to have a good understanding of sort of what, why you're doing this and what's made it, motivating you to do this. In my case, it was really uh, that I thought I saw a better way to consult with clients on public relations than, than I had been working on before and had a vision for how, how I wanted to build the business from there and felt the time was right to do it. I had been in the business at that time, public relations business for 20 years, had a good base of experience. And it's at a point in my life where I said, well, I've got the next 15 or 20 years to really work at this and pursue this vision. So the time was right um, and I felt financially secure enough and professionally secure enough to, to go for it. And I think that's a, that's a decision that um, anybody who wants to move from a uh, full-time job to, or an in-house job to a consultancy has to think about, why do you really want to do this? Is it, a, uh, is it because you have sort of a vision or a dream or an idea that you want to pursue? Or you're just sort of bored with your current situation and say, well, a consulting way might be a more comfortable way to make a buck. Uh, and actually, it, it's, it's, in my experience, a lot more difficult and challenging than an in-house job for that reason, and a lot more risky. So I think you have to, everybody's got to have a very clear idea of why they're doing this when you, when you start uh, to succeed. And, and Jane? Wow. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Um... I agree with George. I think it's much more difficult, potentially. <laughs> I, I think particularly if you think it's about making a buck, as George says. I think you do. So what do you need? I I was, I had been working in, and something that neither Letty or George have mentioned, um, but does relate to me, is I think I'm unemployable. And the reason that I think that is because once I did leave my, as I call it, my alma mater, I went to, I ran a trade association here in the UK, which was international. I then um, 
went back into production, making films and uh, videos, and started working uh, in a new company as an MD with the former owner of the production company that I'd worked for. And it, it became clear to me that as we built that business, which was very much around, um, and we, were, we were doing a consultancy, we were providing a consultancy function with large organizations who were doing transformation projects and not transformation in a cost cutting sense, but genuinely in, innovative transformation projects. And I realized that we'd, we'd kind of developed the skill of consultancy. And what I mean by that is it, very often we have this conversation about the difference between the output and the outcome. So we'd move from delivering tactical film and video because at the end of the financial year, people wanted to spend money to asking the question in the 1990s, dare I say it, which was, OK, well, that's all very well. We can certainly spend your money. But what 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 is the impact that you want and are there behaviours that you want to change? And there was a genuine mystification from clients when they, they would say, oh, well, why don't you just want to take the money and make us something lovely and everybody will have a lovely time and we'll all clap. And well, because, I mean, let's just think of the cost of living crisis everybody's going through now. Well, because while you're making people redundant or you're cutting people's pensions, there's no point in spending a very large sum on a film just to make people feel better. That ain't going to make people feel better. Mm -hmm. So we so we began to develop that awareness with clients around employee engagement and internal communication strategy, which was, as I say, less about the tactical, but more about the helping them through the understanding. So when I came to this world of um, <clears throat> ethics, what I soon realized was that in a world of incredibly brilliant ethics and compliance people, there were a lot of, a lot of lawyers and a lot of compliance people, but they weren't consultative communicators. And I, and I realized, and I think that this is also a clue to add to um, what Letty and George have said, is that you trust the fact that you may have found a niche and trust that and and jump into it if you feel confident to do that, because it's that that will help ground you and help clients to recognize what it is that you're there to do. Great. We do have a comment, by the way, and it's from Amanda, our other panelist, <laughs> who says she's watching but can't get into the conversation. Uh, we haven't tried this before, but Amanda, if you would like to share uh, what you would have shared uh, as uh, an on-screen panelist uh, by using the commenting feature, uh, go right ahead and we'll uh, sort of incorporate that into the conversation. Works for me, works for everyone else. Uh, one of the decisions that I had to make when I started my practice was whether it was going to be just me or if I was going to bring on a partner or uh, hire a team? Uh, did I want to run uh, a small agency or or be a sole practitioner? And having been a manager uh, for a long time, both uh, in the consulting world and the, uh, the corporate world, I was director of corporate communications for two Fortune 400 companies. Uh, I decided to go solo because I'd uh, done enough performance reviews and, and uh, you know, salary management and hiring and firing and all of that. Uh, what about all of you? Um, did, was was this a, 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 a an early consideration, whether it was going to be just you or a team? Did you have a vision of, of building out an agency or staying solo? George, uh, I'd like to start with you, because if I recall, you do or did have a, a, a full agency there at some point. I, I did, yes. The, uh, the start of my journey as an independent consultant was uh, the idea of building an agency uh, and a mid-sized firm that was going to focus on uh, public relations and public affairs, and in particular on uh, sustainability and environmental issues and how organizations could uh, capitalize on those things to improve their performance or how they could protect themselves if they were underperforming so they could get, get the time to improve their performance. And there were, this, was a, this was at a time when there was a lot, a lot of focus beginning, which has intensified 
on not just environmental protection, but the idea that we need to build sort of a more sustainable economy. So that was the that was the starting point. I I, I worked with I sort of built up a team of people who had experience both in public relations and also related disciplines like uh, government relations. Some of those folks were full time employees that uh, we had on on the payroll in the office. The others were consultants themselves, independent consultants, or principals of other agencies that we partnered with. So I guess over time, we sort of developed a hybrid model to the business. And that was something I worked for and built out for about 10 years. And then I, at that point, um, and a lot of this is related to the, the economic economy at that time in 2010, much more challenging environment. And at that point, I made the decision that a more effective way to go forward was just sort of slim it down to a consulting business that was primarily myself, but working largely with consultants as opposed to employees. And that, that's the model that we've had for the last uh, 10 years, which has worked, worked out well. So that, I guess the other point is you may start out with a goal in mind, a goal in mind or a business model in mind, because that can evolve over time. Absolutely. Uh, Letty, how about you? Well, at first, I thought that I was um, going to work on my own. Um, I started with two clients first. Uh, however, at the same time, uh, my sister had another business of um, giving some training and organizing special events for, for companies for many years. So uh, we, we spoke about this and we decided to join forces. So we, we established uh, our agency uh, together as partners. And, um, and then I hired uh, a team. I hired a couple of people at that time in order to, to help me in uh, developing and working on all the, the strategies and tactics that I had with these two clients and then uh, another one to help me bring some more clients. So um, that's the way I started. And, and until now, I have been working on that way. I have a bigger team now. Uh, but uh, I have worked with, with my sister in some uh, in her own business, uh, her own clients, and I have my own. But sometimes we have joined forces in when a client needs like special events, like she does, and when one of her clients needs something about communication. So th that has worked well. Jane. Okay. Yeah, I was. I was also just looking at Amanda's um, conversation. I'll in the share chat, that in a moment. Great. Yeah. <laughs> It's working. Um, so I'm sorry, I was slightly diverted by that. Um, I I took the I started the company because to the point that um, both Letty and George made earlier, when I decided to start working on my own, it was very much on the basis on the back of relationships. So there were clients that I had worked with two in particular. And they were both large companies and they were both leaders, I mean, senior, the most senior leaders in their businesses. So um, I had developed a working relationship with them, said this is what I was thinking about doing. And then I went and I started the company um, 17 years ago. And it was very much on the basis of my individual working relationship. And I haven't, I didn't, I, I took on a PA and a virtual PA, but in terms of having people working with me and supporting the aims of the business, I think because it's, yeah, I, I'm reflecting, I'd, I'm wondering why. I think because I have a specific way of tackling what I do, what I really value is the collaboration that I have with others. And in fact, uh, prior to this, I was having a long discussion with a group of associates who operate in the world of leadership development. And we've been working together for a few years now. And it's a brilliant, brilliant group of people. I don't possibly have the skills that they have. And I was within that group, I was thinking, and this is a this is a wonderful group to be able to work with. And that's how I've chosen to continue the model is to work with, if they'll have me, people who were of like mind, but we have complementary skills. And I think that one of the things that I did at the beginning was do that with quite a lot of, of groups. I don't now. It's one. 
And I think that over over the years, you begin to trust yourself and you begin to understand, you know, your position in that. So I've always I've always worked on my own. But ironically, I am a very collaborative and out there person. So working on my own sometimes can be isolating as a single consultant. So you have to be really careful about creating that that safety network into which you can contribute, but that can also help you. So that's the model that I have. Great. And Amanda shares uh, that it was the year 2000, and I decided it was a good time to change direction. At the start, it was just me. Then I employed many people, bought an office, and realized I no longer uh, did what I liked. Uh, then I went smaller, and now I work with a network of competent communication professionals, and it works very mm -hmm. well for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, very much what you were saying, uh, Jane, and it, it, it was the same for for me uh, as well. Um, in that, um, my model when I started my practice was to uh, have a network, a stable of professionals mm -hmm. with different areas of expertise, and I could build a team. Uh, for whatever assignment I had, if uh, it wasn't something that I could handle independently. But uh, Jane, you raise a really good issue that it can be lonely as an independent con consultant sometimes. It's it's mm -hmm. great when you're out with the client, but the rest of the time you're in an office by yourself. Uh, I know one of the things that I missed was just getting up and walking over to the office next to me and asking, can I bounce <laughs> something off of you? Uh, how important is uh, a network, not necessarily of people to bring in as paid participants in the project, uh, but just people you can talk to, whether it's your IEBC network or uh, some other network? How important is it to maintain connection with, with other communicators if you're out there on your own? Uh, mm. and, and Letty, let me start with you. You're, you're muted. Okay, <laughs> I believe it's quite important to have a network of other colleagues, other communicators, uh, in order to exchange experiences, to know. Oh, oops. Oops. Uh, all right, George. Oh, you're back. Okay. <clears throat> and how did they solve some issues? Um, to have a network with other colleagues. <clears throat> <Also> <clears throat> Also, to make uh, participate in presentations, conferences, um, seminars, lectures, um, maybe, uh, for example, I, I I teach at the university uh, in a master's degree, so you also learn from your students. So everything that is networking, participating in associations like IABC and other professional associations. I participate in, an, in um, the Mexican Association of Women Executives, and, and I also talk to other uh, women executives of other companies. So all that really helps uh, in order to you to, to be up to date, learn how the environment is, and this helps you a lot in, in providing better counseling. Great, right, Jane? Yeah, I think that's really, I think that's really good advice. And one of the beauties of, and, and, and this group, I guess, is testament to that. One of the wonderful things, in fact, the most wonderful thing for me personally about IABC is the international in IABC. And within a generous community like IABC, there's no question that the just hearing people, talking with people, sharing with people keeps you, keeps you fresh and keeps you really mindful that there's a lot going on around your own world and therefore you better well you better be plugged into it but i to pick up on letty's point i think one of the other things is to test your ideas by speaking and with the iabc local networks which is where i was involved in the outset uh, with you with the uk was test ideas with that audience test ideas with a safe audience and even though they're safe, they're, they're good critical friends because they'll say, yes, that was that was OK, Jane, but um, you might want to have emphasised X. And, that, and I mean, that's really helpful to help you hone your craft, I, a craft. Sorry. Yeah. Hone your craft, I would say. George. Yeah, I think uh, in this post-COVID world, a lot of people have gotten 
accustomed to the idea of the lonely nature of a consultant being working from home, even if you're still working for uh, on the client side. And I think we've all learned the importance of making those human connections. And that is really sort of integral to, I think, building out your expertise as a consultant. So for example, I think in addition to working through IABC, uh, when I was focusing on environmental issues, I really worked to create conversations with people who were working in that business, but not from the PR side or the communication side, but from other areas of expertise, like engineers and environmental engineers work on a lot of uh, projects with companies and have like to bring a point of view in about the engineering challenges you have to have. I worked with a lot of government and had a lot of conversations with people in the government relations and lobbying field because a lot of these environmental issues involve uh, legislation that was under consideration, regulations, mm -hmm. or, uh, or or government got procedures you had to follow to get projects, environmental projects built and approved. So reaching out beyond people in, in, in my profession and working with allied professions that brought in other perspectives in ter terms of how this work gets done uh, gave me I made me a stronger consultant and better able to meet the client's needs. It also helped me build a network of people in allied professions who I could actually partner with to pursue new business and serve new business, but would also refer new business to me. That was outside what they weren't communicators, for example, they weren't attorneys, but they knew the value of having a good public relations firm involved on an issue, they would refer the client to me. So it became both a source of improving my own expertise, but also a source of developing new business. Great, and Amanda uh, says that uh, her PA has been with her for 22 years and we worked with her at the organization I resigned from. Uh, she adds that IEBC has been her network of choice, but she's also part of a business web network to keep her grounded as a business person. And IABC was certainly my network of choice. Uh, I don't think I brought anybody in on any of my assignments who I didn't know uh, initially through mm -hmm. IABC. Uh, and in fact, through that process, I became part of the stable that uh, other independent consultants brought in uh, on their assignments. It sort of went back and forth and, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours type of arrangements. Mm -hmm. um, so let's shift gears. Uh, we've, we've all got our consulting practices uh, up and running. How do you find clients? Uh, how, how do you market your business? Uh, Jane, let's start with you on this one. Okay. Uh, I, I'll pick up on the point that George made because <laughs> And we've talked about this a lot at IABC, haven't we, is how do we find the language of business? And to George's point, it it's fine. And uh, so in this niche of ethics, values, leadership development, it's fine for me to be externally pushing a message. But if it's not the language of the person or the individual, the, the um, client that I'd like to attract, then it's no use. So... Being involved in other networks has been a great source of that. So putting yourself into the middle of, so there are organizations that I operate in largely out of the USA, interestingly enough, the SCCE, the Society for Corporate Compliance and Ethics, the ECI, the um, um, Institute of Business Ethics. These are all people who were operating in that world that I had found myself in of which I knew nothing other than the personal conversations or work I was doing with the particular clients. And suddenly it opened up this whole new world and introduced me to them. So that I think, particularly when you're starting out, is a really great way to establish that you are a part of that community and to build up the trust so that people can say, oh, I'm thinking of rolling out an ethics program. Oh, yes, I met Jane at an event or I heard a talk and I think, you know, George's point is well made. So that's certainly where I've found mine. Great. George? Well, in terms of building out a business and finding clients, um, building, a net, building a network both within the communications field, but also within a lot of wide fields and industries that you feel you're well equipped to serve is very important. Uh, 
but it's part of an overall marketing plan or approach to your business, which is also going to include um, targeting sectors you want to work with and companies you want to work with and figuring ways either through a network or directly that you can get in and talk to them. Uh, it involves uh, obviously making yourself visible and findable online because a lot of people, a lot of prospective clients are going to start there looking for people. So you want to be able to have people find you, whether it's through that, social, uh, and also, of course, thought leadership, being and speaking at uh, industry events or forums, both communications field, but also, again, these allied fields that you want to service. And then you can go into all the other sort of tactics, uh, you know, bylined articles, um, uh, media relations and publicity for your own business and down the line. But the starting point, I think, is you really have to sort of have a clear idea of what you offer and what your firm, your, your business offers and what makes that different from a lot of the other people that the, that the prospective clients are going to see. And so the consulting firms and PR firms that I see becoming successful over time is the people who are really define an offer that's a little bit distinctive in the market um, and have a lot of proof of performance they can deliver on that. Uh, and those are the those are the firms I think really are in it for the long haul and uh, create a lot of rewards for you as a as a business owner. Great, uh, Letty, how did you go about marketing your business? Uh, well, as I mentioned before, uh, many of my clients came from people with whom I had worked before in other companies. Uh, I try to do a lot of follow up of of all these colleagues and and mates and people uh, through LinkedIn. Uh, I go a lot into LinkedIn. I, I contact them. I try to make an appointment with them or they refer me to, to, the, uh, to the heads of communication of, of human resources heads, to the CEOs of their own companies so I can make appointments and make my presentations. I participate a lot also in giving Stations in, in in different industry forums, and um, also as I mentioned, as I teach at the university and a master's degree in communication, most of my students already work in communication in different companies. So I have got a couple of clients also from them. They asked me to to participate and to be a, a consultant with them. Um, so that's the way in which uh, mainly referrals. I think people. Uh, Clients that I already have, and they refer me to another another prospect. So that's the main way in which I have uh, obtained some clients. Great. And Amanda says that uh, she speaks at conferences, all kinds of conferences. <laughs> uh, in, in my case, and I mentioned this when I was uh, introducing my consulting practice, uh, former consulting practice, uh, I had a niche, uh, even though I would say half of my consulting was on internal communications. Uh, my niche was technology, and that's what I wrote about on my blog, uh, which led to offers to write bylined articles, uh, communication world among them, but uh, other publications uh, that were niche publications like uh, a, a pension and benefits publication. Uh, about online enrollments uh, when those were newfangled. Uh, uh, and that led to more speaking engagements. Uh, and a lot of this was people saying, when I have a need for a consultant in this space, you're the guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a year or two years later, they'd call and say, okay, now uh, mm -hmm. I, I have that need. Mm -hmm. And I always thought I one of these days I need to create a marketing plan, but I was always booked. Uh, so I, I, I never found that need, uh, which leads to my next question. Uh, should you be in a niche? George, I know that you were doing consulting around uh, environmental and sustainability issues. Uh, is, is this important to have um, a, a, a niche that differentiates you? George, uh, let's start with you because you did have that area of specialization. Right. And it's still largely what we're involved in now. Um, yeah, I think it makes a difference because there's so many other competitors out there when you think about it, both in terms of large firms, medium-sized firms, other solo consultants. And you want to define something about your order, your offer, whether it's expertise, 
um, new ideas and approaches, um, the kind of results you get that are superior to what other firms get, that really just distinguishes you from other people who offer similar services. Uh, basically, I think we need to define like how we help the client achieve their goal goals in some way faster, better, and cheaper than the alternatives. But while you do that, you have to be credible. And the thing that I kind of wrestled with on earlier on as a, running my own consulting business is I started out kind of defining myself by what I knew from working in large PR and advertising firms, which is, uh, you know, we work on these big issues. We provide a full range of services across a range of disciplines and all my materials and things and, and pitch books oriented that way. I was like the world's smallest person, Marstella, if you read it literally. And I realized over a while that, you know, that was fun for me to write, but the prospective clients were kind of looking and saying, well, really? I mean, there's what you and like 10 other people you work with and you can do all this stuff. And we could do a lot of it, but the fact was we weren't closing on business because they just didn't believe we could deliver that versus a large firm. And the fact is we could, but to make the sale, what we had to do was sort of redefine what we offered and be a little bit more uh, clearer and simpler about what we we're doing and also be a lot more uh, direct about the fact that we used other consultants and people in other disciplines and why from both the results perspective and an economic perspective, that was better for the client. And sort of, so once we started reframing the business that way, we had a lot more success. So I think the more you can do to specialize what you do, uh, the, be the better. Letty? Well, at first, I, I decided to go into a niche that it was mainly employee communications and corporate reputation. Um, however, um, on my way, uh, some of my clients started asking a lot for, for training, for training for their leaders on um, effective communication and leadership. And, and so I started to give training. And, and after uh, all these years, I already have like a big portfolio of different workshops and, and training that I do. And it started because the request of my clients and, um, and also because um, I had already managed in, in uh, my previous companies a lot of crisis situations. So some of the people with I, I had worked for um, and I now were already my prospects or clients asked me to help them in managing crisis situations. So I'm already now in, um, in a lot in crisis management. So I think I expanded a little bit about my niche because of clients request and because of my experience and I could do this well. So um, I expanded this, uh, not a lot, but uh, I, I'm focusing now on those. And it was mainly because that, because the requests of some of my clients. Hmm. And Jane. I think that, so let's just take this world of ethics and compliance. What, and I mentioned it at, at the beginning, it leads into when you're working in an organization that has suffered ethical failure, it isn't a matter of helping them to communicate an ethics program better. It's about helping them to understand what the root cause or where the root causes causes usually multiple lie. And inevitably, we come into the arena of leadership behavior. And therefore, there is a natural segue in terms of if, if you're identifying some root causes to helping them out of it. And I guess that's where I found my development very similar to Letty. But so I would I would say that it yes, start absolutely be clear about the purpose and your core, but do allow yourself if if it feels right to move on to evolve. You you know, the world moves incredibly fast and we need to move with it. Um that's not to say, however, and this is something that comes up with the special interest group, the consultant special interest group that we have at IABC now, which has been around since March now this year. And the conversation that comes up a lot is about scope creep, because as we've all talked about, the establishment of that trusting relationship between you as a client, you and a client, 
um, is really fundamental to your business as a consultant. Once you have that, they may try to push the boundaries of the working relationship. We said, oh, look, you're here. We trust you. Could you go off and do that? Mm -hmm. And the conversation that we have in the SIG groups is how do I stop myself from doing that? And or how do I do that in a way that maintains the integrity of what I do, but also delivers the best for the client? So it's a it's a really interesting dilemma, I think, and a, a good it's a good check and balance for yourself because if, for instance, you're being asked to do something that you think maybe it may be okay, but it's kind of beyond scope, and of course you've got the financial aspect of that as well, but beyond scope is but you want to stick to what you're doing a because it's enough and b because you you know you don't really want to head that down down that direction bring in one of your associates and build build another connection into the client so that you're sort of in a way cementing although i'm not very keen on that word but you're could sort of and i'm not keen on solidifying either but you know you're strengthening the connection that you have by being able to offer them something else. Mm -hmm. So I I think it's I think there's a balance. I think there are times when absolutely it's something that you could do, but there are other times when you could provide you you could provide additional resource, but it it, it strengthens your own position. And Amanda says that there uh, is a role for the all-rounder as well. I often tell entrepreneurs to be an all-rounder and then later find a niche. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jane, uh, I was struck by your reference to scope creep, which is something that I dealt with a lot. Mm. Uh, one of the ways I dealt with that was by having the client sign a letter of agreement, not a full-blown mm -hmm. contract, but a letter of agreement that outlined the scope uh, and, and, and was very clear about that. And then if there was scope creep, I was able to say that is beyond the scope that we agreed to it's going to cost you more. Uh, oh. And then I would send them a little mini proposal that would say to do this, it, here's what's involved. And they would either sign off on it or not. Mm. And I, I'm on the other end of that right now. Um, I have Angela Sinicus uh, running an internal communications audit for the company where I work. And I wanted a couple of extra executive interviews. Uh, and she mm. said, great, here's how much they are each <laughs> to, to do extra <laughs> interviews and I checked my budget and said fine and uh but it was a very formal thing it was not just oh sure I'll do I'll do more because right. you want them yeah. uh so I, I think I think that's important and as long as we're talking about money um let, let's talk about the financial side of of consulting uh I, I think um many of us are communicators because we didn't have the temperament or the or the math skills to be cpas or you know uh, work in finance mm -hmm. and accounting um did did you bring somebody on to help you with this how did you how did you manage um invoicing and clients who were late and and, and mm -hmm. things like that uh letty let's let's start with you on this one well, I think this was one of the most difficult things I, I had to deal with. <laughs> um, because, of course, I, I was not, I, I earned a fixed salary in the companies where I used to work. So it was the first time that I had to charge. And I didn't know if it, it, it was better to do it per hour or by project or how to do it. And how, how it was better, especially when you want to get the, your first clients. Mm. What I did is I spoke with other friends, colleagues, and consultants in order to make a research and ask them how they how they charged. And I made like a, a chart of how to charge um, by project or by hour. The, uh, I think the the best way to do it was uh, by project. Uh, some of my clients um, asked me to do like an annual an annual contract, so they pay me an, a monthly fee and I think I think that was the best because then you get a fixed fee every month a fixed income and and when it was like an, a consultant uh, per a number of hours and by projects and um, also I consider the the kind of uh, client the, uh, the kind of company in Mexico we have like very small companies that it calls medium and small companies and the larger companies. So when it was a, a small company or a family organization, so I charge less 
uh, the pen, because they didn't have like a lot of budget and they didn't have a person in communication in, in within the company. So I was like a, a partner and a little bit like an implant for them. And mm -hmm. and when the, it was a larger company and they had a bigger budget and so the scope of the project was larger. So I I, I charge a little bit more, but always um, with a parameter of a chart that I had how to, how to charge depending on the number of hours that I was going to to invest on the project. Great, hey, Jane. Yes, exactly what Letty said. <laughs> I, I, I really I couldn't have put it better myself. I I I think I would just reiterate that uh, from a project perspective, I think that that for me I would will always outline the number of days that that's based on. So if that if we go way over or way under, it's a we we have a different conversation or an additional conversation. But I, I think the to have that framework, I, I mean, exactly exactly as Letty described it. Great. George, how about you? Did you bring on an accountant? How did you set your rates? Well, I had the benefit of kind of growing up over 15 years in sort of the the big PR agency economic model. So I had a lot of experience in terms of how to set hourly rates and, and build out from there. Um, so that piece of it I had covered. The areas where I first early on went out and got help was from an accountant who specialized in working with consulting companies and agents and small agencies and could sort of address all sort of the financial issues and a good attorney who worked with me on things like uh, contracts and agreements and other areas where I maybe had an issue with a client that had to get resolved. And that's expertise that is always worth buying. Um, I did not spend any time myself sort of keeping my own um, financial records uh, in, 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 in an accounting program and then spending time entering that. My time when I wasn't serving a client was gonna be spent on marketing the business and growing the business. And the investing in outside professionals to handle those sort of special financial needs was the most efficient way to go. Um, and it's something, again, that develops over time. When I had sort of an agency with more employees involved in it, um, we thought we had to look in terms of different billing rates for people sort of based on what we were paying them as far as salaries. Um, and then how we sort of translate that into work on projects. So there's a lot more to, to, uh, to manage. Uh, now my approach is a lot more streamlined and simplified for where I am in life right now. And basically, I sort of do the work on a project basis, where it's budgeted, again, based on an estimate of hours, but uh, the billing is by project. And uh, that that's just simpler to deal with all around. Right. And from Amanda, we have uh, that she also specifies what's included in a retainer, because that can get out of hand. Uh, when I started, I got an accountant on board. Uh, and Letty, I agree with you. Uh, retainer clients are the best. Uh, mm. and, and the reason for that is cash flow. Uh, and I learned uh, during my first couple of years as an independent consultant, the cash flow is actually more important than annual revenue mm -hmm. uh, because you can be doing just fine with your annual amount. You look at that and go, wow, I had a good year. And yet I had these stretches where I wasn't sure I was going to be able to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. Charles Pizzo was the one who actually told me that uh, the way to deal with that, if you don't have retainer clients, uh, where the money is coming every month, is when you get uh, an assignment uh, to build them part of it up front uh, and make sure that you're billing in phases, that you're not just collecting everything at the at the end of the assignment. And, mm -hmm. and that served me very, very well. Um, speaking of the end of the assignment, uh, when a project is over, um, how do you end that? Do you do an analysis or or, or a measurement uh, to share with the client, or do you just <laughs> say, "Well, that we've done everything we've contracted for; it's all done." Bye. <laughs> how do you how do how do you uh, leave that client at the end of of the assignment, uh, George? Hopefully it's not goodbye. It's it's what's next. Oh, okay, <laughs> now on to our next job uh, with the same client. And I think if you set if you satisfy the client, uh, under promise and over deliver on an assignment, 
very often you're going to get referred into the next project, whether it's with the same contact or with somebody else in the organization. Uh, but, but I think the, the larger point this gets to is sort of how do you measure performance. And we certainly, when working on projects, are providing those measurements all the way through. So if it's like a one-year program on a quarterly basis, we're sort of reporting and how we're hitting the marks in terms of the uh, both the tasks we want to accomplish and also the audiences we reached and how effective we were getting the messages through and what actions we uh, prompted through that. Um, so, uh, and that also will sort of lead you on to the next assignment with the client. Okay, Jane? Um, I, I will always um, have a debrief meeting. So with, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the longer term projects whereby you've been inputting over a number of years quite often and it not at the end not we don't leave it till the end but there's a kind of rolling gathering of information that says let's just say um a series of workshops uh, have a clear set of outcomes attached to them and making sure that we're checking in and getting the feedback on the workshops getting the feedback on the facilitators getting the feedback on the outcomes and just building a picture of the the impact that you've had over that period of time and the and the impact that it's had on the people in the business um and because i tend to deal mm -hmm. in those longer term projects it's it's less about delivering um something tactical than something that's more long term which is slightly more complex but as george says it's a great way of building longer term relationships <laughs> and buddy well, just as Jane says, I, I, I also do a lot of, um, for example, I did like a change management program that lasted for mm -hmm. many months and I did different activities. So I developed like periodic reports and I did a lot of surveys and questionnaires after every activity in order to evaluate every, every, uh, any, any uh, of those act activities. And um, I believe evaluation ensures that you really achieve the project's objectives. And the evaluation results build the client's confidence in and satisfaction with your work. Um, evaluation promotes also learning for myself and from the, for the client, because you will start comparing the project to previous ones, and then you improve your efficiency and your effectiveness. So you learn a lot uh, to conduct each step of the assignment better. So each project improves your services, and each um, and I believe that works a lot better, very good for your client and for you, and also to ensure with your client that you reach the objective that you pre previously established at the beginning. We have uh, less than two and a half minutes left, but I want to sneak one last question in. Uh, and and that is, did you, have you ever had to fire a client, and and how did you go about it, uh, Letty? Let's let's start with you on this one. Um, well, I I didn't have to fire one, but um, I believe that that it's very much in line with what are some of the issues of consulting, and one of them for me, one of the most important is ethics. So at first, when you start talking to a prospect, and you need to have ask a lot of questions and to be sure that what, what is he expecting from you. And one of the prospects at this time, like uh, tried to tell me that they wanted me as a third party in order to contribute <clears throat> in some external affairs and government, <clears throat> government affairs activities. <clears throat> but, but they expected me like to, like to bribe uh, one of the mm -hmm. government authorities. Um, so they didn't want to do it themselves directly but to bribe them in order to reduce mm -hmm. some fines or some, and to give them some permits that they needed. So, so that's the way in which you learn what they really expect from you. So, Oops, looks like we've lost Letty. So, uh, oh, Letty's back. We lost you for a sec at the end. Uh, George? Um. I don't know if it would be called firing a client, but I think there's definitely been some engagements where we agree, agree to a mutual parting of the ways at the conclusion. And um, a lot of that was related to clients that had just unrealistic expectations that you couldn't align over time. Uh, be, it would just become very, frustrate, very frustrating for everybody. 
So I think there, there are times like that when you when you have to sort of part ways. And the other is obviously anything like Letty's talked about when you've got sort of an ethical hmm. issue or a legal issue, uh, that's a point just to cut it off right there. And while I haven't been involved in those things myself, I've definitely seen other situations where that's happened. And your best bet is just cut, cut your losses and move on quickly. Mm -hmm. Great. And Jane? Yeah, very quickly. In addition to what George and Letty have said, I've had the situation deciding at the outset of a project that even though you've gone through the proposal development and working with them to get to that point, there might come a point and there has come a point when I've thought this is not going to go well. And so you agree to part company before you even start, because in the build up to that engagement, there's just something that doesn't feel right. And if it doesn't feel right, then the chances are it probably isn't. I had uh, one instance uh, fairly early in my consulting practice uh, where the person I was working with was terrific. Uh, his boss was terrible. Right. Uh, and he kept forwarding messages to me he said, ask your consultant and consultant would be in quotes uh and uh when it ended he he had another assignment for me and i politely declined uh but i also made a determination as a result of this that i wasn't going to work for smaller organizations my experience right. was in larger companies i could navigate yeah. uh big companies because that was my experience and i i never worked with a smaller company again uh yeah. So it was a learning experience from that perspective. Uh, we're out of time. Um, I want to thank uh, panelists and um, especially Amanda for weighing in through the, the chat function. Uh, we would have much rather have seen your face, but uh, this actually worked okay uh, in a pinch. I want to let everyone know that the November episode, uh, episode number 86 of Circle of Fellows, is scheduled for November 17th. Uh, it's going to be at 4 p.m. Eastern, later than usual. Uh, that's because it will be the 18th for Zora Artis uh, in Australia. Uh, Zora will be a panelist along with Alice Brink, Sue Human, and Mark Schumann on the topic of branding, uh, which was to an extent something we talked about here, uh, branding our own practices. Uh, but uh, thank you all and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.